Thank you so much, Gyanji. It's really great to be here today. And thank you. There are so many concurrent sessions, and they're all interesting. So we really appreciate the people with a research orientation and inquisitive minds who are here right now with us this morning. Thank you. I'm going to very briefly address a number of issues that build upon what Gyanji and, and also uh, Radhika also have, have covered. So when we're talking about why research, I thought that I would be speaking after our keynote speech on the, the GAP, the Global Action Plan uh, with WHO for the prevention of blindness, which would have pointed out uh, that we really ha cannot be complacent. As the Lancet articles brought out in the last few months, uh, we are, are projecting a tripling in the number of people who are blind and severely visually impaired between now and 2050 if we keep doing what we're doing. It's not enough. So the number of people in care are increasing. We know we have a human resource crunch. Uh, who needs to be brought into the workforce? Where? How? Uh, facilities are not enough in number and not productive enough. And we all know and we worry about inequity of services. Are they reaching everyone and with the quality required? When we are addressing research with NGOs, we're usually talking about three different classifications of, of research. More the community uh, population-based epidemiologic research, uh, operations research to better understand how are we doing in service delivery and how can we improve it. And finally, also clinical research to improve outcomes. As with any research skill building, we're largely talking about this cascade of intervention points to strengthen skill base. In first and foremost, defining the research problem, the area that no one gives sufficient uh, attention to, in my estimation, and then moving on through the other aspects of research. I want to point out especially the bottom line, which is applying results in publishing are extremely important uh, to make sure that we're using our research to actually improve practice re and reach more people. Um, I'm going to pass by this. Uh, I'll mention a couple of uh, studies that were done with active NGO support 40 years ago and 20 years ago. Uh, this uh, Nepal blindness survey, of which I was uh, involved in the design, implementation, and analysis, uh, was the first uh, comprehensive national survey of its kind. But beyond being a very uh, a useful opportunity to identify what were the uh, causes of blindness and how were they distributed across the country of Nepal, there also were a number of unintended positive effects of of doing the survey, which since then, SEVA Foundation and many of our partners, many of this room, have adopted and built upon in the years since. And that is, as we're building the cotters, uh, the teams who are conducting research, take a look at then what can be the role of those people in the long term in the program. Uh, we found that uh, with the Nepal Blindness Survey, virtually everyone who was hired to be an enumerator in the very beginning was then asked to stay on and be trained as the first, uh, the first waves of ophthalmic assistance. So uh, we're always looking for unintended positive uh, benefits of research. Uh, another study from uh, 20 years ago was the Tibet Eye Care Assessment. Uh, everyone said it could not be done. It was accomplished. And uh, with active government effort, as well as NGO effort, uh, we were able to pinpoint for the first time ever in Tibet uh, the, the, uh, the, these profiles of information that were then used to build the subsequent program. In operations research, a number of areas take a lot of pre prominence. Among them is certainly research on children. I'm just citing a small number of the hundreds of articles that have been produced in the last few years, many of them right here from India, and we're going to hear about some of those uh, in the next few minutes. Another area for operations research is how to improve the equity and cost of care. And, uh, and there have been uh, just a, a growing number of research teams addressing these issues so we can use our scarce resources wisely. There's also research on how do we go about scaling services, scaling service delivery processes that work. 
and uh, this study was developed based on work that a number of us in this room have done together over the past eight years. Uh, I'll just give one quick example from the AIDS Eye Initiative with which SAVA works with uh, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, we have been using, while, while conducting a training program and service program, we've been studying the impact on offering uh, this uh, early intervention with CMV retinitis and the very positive impact this has had for patients now in seven countries around the world. Uh, it's resulting in uh, more papers being accepted. And finally now, valgentyclovir has been added to the WHO list of essential medications where it was not there before. When moving forward, when it comes to collaborative research, uh, I think a big purpose of this work is to simply kindle the awareness of the need for evidence. I mentioned in my opening remarks, we talk a lot about anecdotes and stories, but really we want to now move into being able to back up those anecdotes with actual data, really know how, how we're doing. We also need to build those research skills that then uh, that can be as basic as popularizing routine data collection and review that's done in all of our institutions every day. How many of us step back to even look at what we're doing and how we could do it better? Uh, we now know we ha need to prioritize research uh, on in high yield needs. And beyond publications is the huge arena of using the findings to improve service delivery. And I look forward to our talking about that when we come back to our second part of our session today. Where we're talking about four case studies having to do with um, applying research in the NGO setting. So uh, thank you very much.